think I am so excited and honored to be speaking with you guys today and sharing this message. It's a little bit of a different setting, but it's still super exciting to share it with whoever hears it. And it was pretty cool that Pastor Brian shared at the beginning, or maybe during offering, that we want blessings to overtake us, because I'm talking about blessing today. And I was thinking about what a true blessing is and how we receive this. We all have preconceived ideas about what blessing looks like. There's even a hashtag online, and it's hashtag blessed. So people put this with many different things. Their pictures of their dogs, their families, their food, their jobs. There's an idea behind being blessed, and typically it has to do with good things. So some of you might feel like you're in a season of being blessed, and some of you might feel like you're in a season of being cursed. But no matter what the case is, These things can be encouraging to us when we see others being blessed, or it can be discouraging because we feel like we're not as blessed as somebody else. So if you'll turn with me to Matthew 5, verses 1 and 2, that's where we're going to start. This is where Jesus began his Sermon on the Mount. And there is similarity here between Jesus and Moses. When Moses gave a sermon in Deuteronomy 27, he was speaking on blessings and cursings. And now Jesus is on a mountain speaking about blessings and cursings. So Matthew 5, 1 and 2, it says, When he saw the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and after that he sat down. His disciples came to him. Then he began teaching them, saying. So the reason I stopped right there is because there's crowds of people and a lot of different types of people around. And some of those people are political religious groups, so that's Samaritans and Zealots. There's social vocational groups, and that's publicans and scribes. And there's religious groups, which would be Sadducees, Pharisees, Essenes, and Nazarenes. And to bring that to modern day ways of thinking, it was kind of like Catholics and Pentecostals and Democrats and Republicans. Some things we all agree on. And some things none of us agree on. So some of the people thought they were more blessed because they were part of a religious group or a political group. And some people thought they were cursed because they were on the outside of that. So they also had a perception of what being blessed looks like. So Jesus gave the people of that day the posture for true blessing and what true blessing looks like. So number one was In Matthew 5, 3, it says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for heaven is theirs. So the first thing Jesus says is the poor in spirit are blessed. This kind of goes against everything we think about when we think about being blessed. It doesn't mean a personality type. Poor in spirit isn't talking about carrying yourself poorly or being a Debbie Downer. So that's a good thing. But what he's talking about is our view of ourselves in relationship to God. So a few weeks ago when I went to the women's prison, this became clear to me. As I arrived at the chapel, most people would think when you go into the prison, you would be scared and there would be a lot of tension and stress possibly. But when I arrived at the chapel, I went into the room and immediately I could feel the presence of God. And I didn't understand why it seemed like every church service I had been in, people needed to be prompted to feel the presence of God. If the chairs weren't right, or if the preaching wasn't right, or really anything, if someone offended them before they came into service, or right after they went into service, they weren't affected by the presence of God. But then in the chapel service, the heat wasn't great that day, so it was cold at the time, and the chairs were hard, and the Bibles were old. There's no sound system. There's no music. And so I didn't understand why these women were experiencing the presence of God so fully when sometimes, even for myself, I don't experience the presence of God that way. I came to this verse, and it really spoke to me about that. These women had already had their sin exposed, and 
Nobody looked up to them from society or from religious groups. People don't look up to prisoners. And so they came to God, not in a spirit of pride, but poor in spirit. And their view of themselves was not a high view. Rather, they came before God broken and needy. In Isaiah 41, 13 and 14, it says, For I am the Lord your God who takes hold of your right hand and says to you, Do not fear, I will help you. Do not be afraid, you worm Jacob. Little Israel, do not fear. For I myself will help you, declares the Lord, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. So Jacob is called a worm here, and Israel is called little. If God came to me and said that, I don't think I would be very encouraged if that's where he started out with me. Like, you're little, you're a worm. There's even a song that says, nobody likes me, everybody hates me, I think I'll just go eat worms. And that's what I was kind of reminded of as I was reading this verse. Nobody likes a worm. So being called a worm by God probably wasn't super encouraging. But the reason it's encouraging here is because when you recognize that you have nothing left, God will help you in that moment. They didn't have to be afraid because God was with them. So as we see sick people, people dying, people losing their jobs, especially right now, we recognize that we can't do it on our own. And it's the perfect time to come before God, poor in spirit. In Isaiah 41, 17, it says, The poor and needy search for water, but there is none. Their tongues are parched with thirst. But I, the Lord, will answer them. The God of Israel will not forsake them. So then in verse 20, it says, So that people may see and know and may consider and understand that the hand of the Lord has done this, that the Holy One of Israel has created it we see God pour out his blessing on the poor in spirit. And it also is a testimony of who God is. And then Jesus continues another opposite way, opposite worldview of being blessed. Jesus says, blessed are those who mourn for they will be comforted. So number two is those who mourn are blessed. This whole sermon goes together. So while he does comfort us when we're sad and when we're upset about our circumstances, it doesn't have to do with people dying or something like that. He is addressing the mourning of our sin because we are poor in spirit. Paul wrote to the Corinthian church about this very thing and said in 2 Corinthians 7, 9, and 10, I now rejoice not because you were grieved, but because your grief led to repentance. For you were grieved as God willed, so that you didn't experience any loss from us. For godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret, but worldly grief produces death. When a person or a dream dies, we grieve that because it's the loss of life to us. When we mourn our sin, we're grieving that we've lost out on the opportunity to truly live for Christ. So you might wonder, how in the world are we blessed from that? And Paul says it right in that verse, that our grieving leads to repentance, which leads us back to Christ, and that's where we're comforted, and from that we're blessed. So we must first recognize that we're sinners, we're poor in spirit, and then we're able to experience his full blessing. In 2 Corinthians 1, Three, it says, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort. So we recognize we're poor in spirit. It brings us to repentance. And then when we mourn our sin and the separation it brings, we're comforted because we're in a position to be comforted because Jesus comes in and changes our situation. It places us in a position to receive what God has for us. And then Jesus continues in verse 5, so Matthew 5, 5, Blessed are the humble, for they will inherit the earth. Some of your Bibles may say meek. We might think this is a personality trait, like meek and mild. Those who don't talk that much are pretty quiet. But that's not what this is talking about. It's not taking those out who have a bold personality. There is a parallel between Matthew 5, 5 and Psalms 37, 11, where it says, blessed are the humble for they will inherit the land and will enjoy abundant prosperity. So Matthew 5, 5 says the humble will inherit the earth and Psalms 37 says the humble will inherit the land. 
And from Psalms 37, David gives an idea of what true humbleness looks like. So Psalms 37, 5, he says, Commit your ways to the Lord, trust in him, and he will act, making your righteousness shine like the dawn, your justice like the noonday. Be silent before the Lord and wait expectantly for him. Do not be agitated by the one who prospers in his way, by the person who carries out evil plans. Refrain from anger and give up your rage. Do not be agitated. It can only bring harm. For evildoers will be destroyed, but those who put their hope in the Lord will inherit the land. A little while and the wicked person will be no more. Though you look for him, he will not be there. So from those verses, we see that the humble, they trust in God. They commit their ways to the Lord. They get quiet before the Lord and they do not fret about the wicked. So we recognize that the poor in spirit, we are poor in spirit, and we mourn that. And then we are humbled before God because he takes care of our sin, and we recognize we can't do anything without him. So first, we're humbled before God. We follow his leading because everything we have made for ourselves hasn't worked out. We follow his mission because anything else isn't worth our time. We get quiet before the Lord because we recognize that what he is speaking to us is going to be so much better than anything we have to say. I'm not saying that God doesn't want you to have plans or to speak. But when we're humbled before God, we recognize that everything we do, everything we plan, and everything we say will submit to the authority of God. Then we are humbled before people. I'm not as much of a fan of this one because sometimes we like to share our opinions. Some of us have a lot of opinions, some of us not so many. But when we have one, we are very opinionated people. And sometimes we just know that we're right. In fact, when I was in Bible school, I was known for preaching at people when I knew they were wrong. I would get my Bible and I would prove them wrong, even more wrong than I already knew they were. And I was so ready to prove somebody wrong that I wasn't recognizing that God needed to do the work in their life. And we have a spirit of pride when we think we can do a better work in people's life than the Holy Spirit. The other day, someone told me something I knew was wrong. And immediately, I wanted to go right at them with the Bible and start preaching at them. And the Holy Spirit stopped me. Thankfully, I didn't have to do that. But in Romans 8, 1, he reminded me, Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And in John 16, 8 and 11, it says, When he comes, he will convict the world about sin, righteousness, and judgment about sin because they do not believe in me, about righteousness because I'm going to the Father and you will no longer see me, and about judgment because the ruler of this world has been judged. So there is no condemnation in Jesus. It's the Holy Spirit's job to convict people. It isn't our job to change people's lives. So when we're humbled before God, we're also humbled before people because we recognize that the same Holy Spirit that is working in our lives is the same Holy Spirit that is working in their lives. We haven't earned what God is doing in our lives. We haven't learned how to earn salvation. And so we cannot show people the way it's the Holy Spirit's job. Now, I'm not saying that we don't speak truth. The Bible says that all scripture is profitable for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. That the Holy Spirit is the one who will do the work. And I want to end with this thought because it is such a comfort that Jesus doesn't say, blessed are the people who have it all together or have figured out the whole salvation thing. Instead, he says, blessed are those who are poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are those who who are humble. So if you have come to the end of your resources and the end of your ability, that's the perfect place to be blessed. You don't have to have it all together. In 2 Chronicles 7, 14, it says, And my people who bear my name humble themselves, pray and seek my face, and turn from their evil ways. Then I will hear from heaven, forgive their sin, and heal their land. So God is ready to pour out his spirit 
on those who humble themselves. And just like Pastor Brian was saying during the offering, who doesn't want more of God's blessings and more of God's spirit pouring out in their life? So if you're listening today and you recognize that you are poor in spirit, that you need God, you're in a place where you don't know how to get out of it, God is ready to pour out his blessings from heaven on you today. And if you're still stuck in your mourning of failure and regret from your past, you feel like you can't get past that failure, then God is ready to comfort you in your mourning. And if you need to humble yourselves before him, which can be really hard because it just is, he is ready to pour out his spirit on your life. Let's pray. God, thank you for this day, and thank you for each person that is listening today. I pray that you would bless them and show them more of who you are, that we can come before you and pour in spirit, mourning, and humble, and you will pour out your blessings on us.